Hello everyone, welcome to the final part of the logo inlay project. This is the video where we finish everything out. I'm gonna get it sanded, gonna get it sanded, gonna sand a little bit more, and then sand even a bit more, and then apply some finish and be completely done. But of course, before we get to the sanding, there's a couple more things that we need to do. Um, the first one is we got to get this off of the um, wood backer, off of this MDF plate. Um, so I'll show you how I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to machine the French cleat um, holder in the back of this so we can actually mount to it. I'm going to do that before I do any of the sanding. But I think at this point, the... Um, the wood is very fully sealed. Uh, most of the grains and most of the pores seem to be sealed. The oil has soaked in as much as it can. So let's go ahead and get this off of the MDF, get the mount machined in, and then we can sand all this down and apply the final finish. I should have planned this out a little bit better. I was actually going to machine little pockets in the bottom of the MDF so I could kind of get a crowbar under there and pry it out, but I kind of completely forgot to do that. So I'm just using a utility knife to make a little pocket in one end, wedging a crowbar underneath of that, and then just kind of working my way around. And it makes a nice, satisfying noise when it finally breaks free. I'm making the pocket for the cleat on the CNC router again. I'm just mounting it on the vise upside down and I'm using the outside jaws on the vise just so it gives something to rest against when I'm doing the cutting. I'm just making a little pocket on the back for the French cleat to sit inside. It's just an aluminum French cleat, which you'll see here in a second. The pocket's only about an eighth inch deep, and this is pretty uneventful. Since this was all mounted in the vise and I had it indicated, I thought this would probably be a pretty good time to sign the back. I'm using air quotes right here, you can't see. Um, so I have this V bit that I've actually never used before. Uh, mocked something up really quick in SolidWorks, just some basic text, and then engraved it. I'm using the trace function in SolidWorks or actually HSM Express, which basically just traces a path and then I just went like 10 foul um, down from that and it'll just kind of engrave this um, lettering in the back of it. Now all that's left to do is mark the location of the two mounting holes for the cleat, drill them out and tap them. And this goes um, pretty much exactly how you think. Use a drill press to drill them, use a tap to tap them and uh, use a screwdriver to screw it in. <laughs> nice and simple. I told myself that I wasn't going to finish the back of this. It's going to be against the wall. No one's really going to see it. Um, you know, it's just going to be some extra time for no real point. But 
here I am sanding the back of it. Um, I'm just using a random orbit sander, which is the same process I'm going to use for the front of it. And I'm moving up grits, um, starting with an 80 grit, then 120, then 180, then 220, and then 320. And um, with aluminum, you always need to make sure that you clean it in between the grits because the dust kind of gets on there and it kind of smudges it a little bit. Uh, 409 is kind of my favorite way to do that. Um, either that or Dawn um, dish soap, either one of those does a really good job cleaning that dust that accumulates out of it. After I ran through all the grits with the random orbit sander, I used one of these red scotch bright pads. They're made for metal and they have a nice um, finishing effect. They kind of even out the grain really nice on aluminum. So I'm just kind of going back and forth over that and then cleaning it off. I realized during sanding I wasn't quite thrilled with the way the lettering looked with just the basic engraving, so I decided to fill it in with some nail polish. This is kind of a simple trick that I've seen done, but I've never actually really done myself. You just take some nail polish, go over the top of it, squeegee off the excess on top, and then you can just come back with a rag of acetone later and then just wipe off the residue that stays on top. And unfortunately, I went to move the camera angle to show you the wiping off of the acetone and forgot to hit record, but it is very simple. Just throw some acetone on some rag, wipe it off, and you are done. So here is what the back looks like after the finishing and after wiping the lettering away with acetone. Looks pretty good. I did do one last thing off camera. If you have ever worked with bare aluminum or brushed aluminum, you know that it likes to pick up fingerprints like crazy. And this actually really isn't picking up that many fingerprints. And the reason is because I actually doused the whole thing with baby oil, let that set for about 15 minutes and then wiped it off. So it's kind of eh, somewhat impregnated with oil and it's um, less able to pick up fingerprints. So you can actually touch this and handle this without having to like re-sand the whole thing down because the fingerprints just kind of get embedded inside the grain. So that's one thing I did. Now I'm not 100% done with the back of this just yet because there's something that kind of annoys me here. When I machined the pocket for the French cleat, there's some machining marks left in here. They're just really difficult to sand in these little tiny corners. So that's one issue. And the other issue is the French cleat goes in like that. This goes against the wall, nice and simple. Well, the problem is there is absolutely zero play in this cleat, like none whatsoever. So that means when this is attached to the wall, you will have to line this up absolutely perfect and slide it perfectly down or else you will just scratch up this whole area around it. So that is not ideal. That is what we call user hostile in um, product development. So I'm gonna go back and fix that. Give me just a couple seconds. I'll be right back. So here is the solution. I basically just took the pocket that came right down to here and just made it slightly wider. And I'll do something with the finish on this. But now when you attach this secondary cleat, you have a lot more room to kind of find it and it will want to rest in the middle naturally. So there you go. Uh, the other thing that you might notice is all the tape lines because I taped over this whole thing and eh, just you know to protect it when I was machining it. And here's what the magic of baby oil will do. I'll just take some baby oil. You can see it evens out that finish real easy. And we'll just kind of leave this on for a few minutes and then just kind of buff it off with the shop towel. So yeah, simple as that. Uh, baby oil is pretty cool, just discovered this. So now that I have the back all finished, it's time to move on to sanding up the sides. The sides are not that difficult, but they're just a little bit awkward because it's just kind of a long skinny track all the way along the outside. Fun fact, I was actually going to use a wood vise on the end of my workbench for this, but the one I've been trying to order for the last month keeps getting lost. I am on my second lost one, so I need another solution. Um, but in any event, I am just kind of clamping this to the edge of the table using the random orbit sander and just sanding around the edges. Because of the machining marks along the outside, I decided to start with 80 grit just to remove the vast majority of those 
before you move up to the next step in sanding, you want to make sure that there's no visible lines. It's all very uniform. And so I started out with 80 and that actually removed a fair amount of material and got everything nice and uniform. And I just made sure that I didn't see any machining marks whatsoever before I moved up to the next grit. The grit progression for this was 80, 120, 180, 220, 320, and then eventually 400. Um, somewhere around the 300 grit mark, I noticed that the random orbit sander just was leaving a lot of marks um, on the material, and I wasn't able to get rid of those tiny little swirls, so I actually just took the um, pads of paper off of the sander and just started doing all this by hand. I just kind of stood up on its end and did, you know, 25 strokes, flipped it around, did 25 strokes on the other side, and flipped upside down and repeated the process. And this was you know, somewhat labor intensive, but really it didn't take that long. I think um, the total of the edge sanding eh, maybe was about one to two hours total. So it really wasn't that bad. One of my favorite and most used tools in my shop is my Nova Voyager drill press. And the really cool thing about it is it has a DC motor and it can go from 50 RPM all the way up to 5,500 RPM without changing any belts. All you need to do is just rotate a little dial in the front of the machine and that is that. So I can go from something like this where I'm at about you know, 2,500, 3,000 RPM with this Scotch-Brite pad or I can just press a button and go down to 50 RPM for some countersinking. And for this, the nice benefit that this gives me is I'm just kind of smoothing out that edge, um, just kind of evening everything out from the sanding. And then because it's kind of a um, you know, flexible um, pad, it actually adds just a little bit of a contour along the outsides. As you notice, I didn't do really any chamfer or radius along the top or the bottom edges, but by doing it this way, I kind of just round everything out and soften those edges just a little bit. And now it's time to finally finish the face of this and then we will be done. I followed pretty much the same process as I did for the sides using the random orbit starting at 80 just to get rid of the machining marks, then moving up to the 120, then the 180, and then 220. I did end up stopping at 220 for reasons I will get to in a second, but the other grits went through just fine. I was really worried that I would just be embedding a bunch of um, aluminum dust inside the grain and that there'd, I don't know, be some issues, but it actually went really quickly. I'd say it was only maybe a minute or two worth of sanding per grit was all that was needed. And in between like eh, every grit or every other grit, I just kind of wiped it down with a little bit of mineral spirits let that dry, and then proceeded with the next grit. So yeah, this really wasn't that big of a deal. Now, when I got up to the 220 grit, I noticed that the um, sealer that I had put on previously really didn't seem like it was still there. Now, I am not a woodworker. This is one of the first times I'm really messing um, too much with wood. And to me, it just seemed like the sealer was completely gone and did absolutely nothing. Um, the pores were open, the grain was open, um, I was starting to get dust into the pores, and the wood just felt and looked like there was absolutely nothing on it. It looked like bare, raw wood, the same wood that I started with just when I faced everything down. So I made kind of an executive decision to go ahead and reseal it, but not use the water locks, but to actually grab this seal coat, uh, which is a shellac based sealer. It dries a lot quicker. Um, it goes on very quick, just like the other stuff, but it dries very quickly, maybe like a half an hour, 45 minutes in between coats. You just put on a coat, sand it off, put on another coat. So I ended up doing this three times to try and build up that seal once again. So here's where I ran into a couple issues with finishing this. I knew this was gonna be a little bit challenging because I've got the aluminum and the wood and you have to sand them at the same time. The original plan was to use um, this Scotch-Brite pad, which I just kind of carpet taped to a piece of wood and do a nice brushed finish to match the brushed finish that's on the sides. 
The problem with this is even with the sealer on there, it just embeds so much aluminum dust directly into the wood grain, and the only good way to clean it is with soap and water. If you've ever dealt with wood, you know that water will raise the grain and make the wood very rough, as you can hear right now. This whole thing is very silky smooth, and so it raises the grain, and then you further have to sand it down. If you sand it again with this, you're going to further get more into the grain. If you use it with the random orbit, I found that these pads will tend to not leave as much um, dust inside the grain, but then all your brush marks go away. So I had a little bit of a conundrum here and I decided last minute that I'm just going to leave this um, with the random orbit pattern on here. This is 320 grit. And I think it looks pretty decent, at least that's what I'm telling myself. It is a nice compromise between the two different finishes. It's very uniform. It takes a little bit of work to get this uniform, but I think it's kind of a nice contrast from the really shiny edge. So I think that'll work out. But as I feared, there's really not a good way that I've found to make it so you can sand the aluminum and not have that aluminum dust get into the wood grain. I think at this point there's two things that I'd like to point out. Um, if you're not familiar with my channel, you know that I do a lot of prototyping and a lot of testing, and this project was no different. Um, I tested out a lot of different finishes. I tested out several different pore fillers. This one actually has five applications of pore filler on the inside. Um, I tested some different Danish waxes, um, some paste wax finishes. I tested out all sorts of different products and um, different techniques. And what I really came down to the conclusion was that it's really almost impossible to keep the aluminum dust from getting embedded inside the grain. It's just too porous. Um, what I did is I have this sanding sponge that I use a lot of times with aluminum and it has a lot of aluminum dust in it. And I also have a Scotch-Brite pad that has a bunch of aluminum embedded inside. And I would put on a finish, put on a sealer, and I have like little notes on the back of each one of these, what I did. And as soon as you brush this across, no matter what I did, you're going to get that aluminum dust inside. So I did quite a bit of um, research on that to try and figure out the best way to do it. So um, it was not for a lack of trying. The other thing that I'd like to point out is there is kind of an obvious solution here. Why wouldn't I do these inlays separately, finish them, finish the aluminum, and then put the two in together? Well, I did think about that and I did some heavy testing on that as well. There is almost no way on the aluminum to finish it, um, let's say without these wood pieces, to finish it and keep that sharp edge. Um, it will always want to round off just a little bit unless I do something like a surface grinder or you know some kind of finishing method like that, which I don't have a surface grinder, but you're always going to just round off or break that edge ever so slightly and then you're going to get a little bit of a dip and then the sharp edge of the wood or maybe you won't get a sharp edge on the wood and you will feel this transition. Right now, if you were in my shop and you closed your eyes and you moved your finger along these seams, you cannot feel the transition. Um, there is one trick. If you close your eyes and think about temperature and really gauge the temperature between them, the aluminum is a little bit colder. But if you use the side of your finger where it's less sensitive to temperature, you really honestly cannot feel any of these transitions. If you go fast, you can kind of feel a little bit of the stick of the metal versus the wood. But generally speaking, you cannot feel or really even see any of these transitions. And that was the original purpose of this project. I did not find a way to where I could put these in after the fact, after it had been finished, and have them still line up this same way. And now it's time to finally apply the finish. I'm using an Osmo 3043, which is a hard oil finish. I found out about this through another YouTube channel, which is, I think, Blacktail Studios. There's a link down below. He makes really nice um, furniture with large wood slabs, and I really liked the finish that he was achieving. It doesn't really look like there's a plastic film on the top like so many other people are doing nowadays with polyurethanes and whatnot. It has a nice natural satin finish, which is exactly what I was going for with this project. 
Also, anything sitting on top of the aluminum I thought would look really artificial and strange. The nice thing about this finish is it's relatively easy to apply. You basically just put some on the piece, wipe it around, uh, wipe it in with a cloth, and then just kind of wipe off the excess, and then let it sit either 12 or 24 hours, and then you can just apply another coat. Um, some people only do two. I'm doing a couple more and I'll explain why, but it is a relatively easy finish. The only downside to this stuff is it is pretty expensive. This little jar that you see is about 30 bucks. Now it does get cheaper the more you buy, but for a project this small, I didn't want to get a large amount. I just kind of wanted to test it out. So keep that in mind, this stuff is not cheap. After letting that first coat sit overnight, so you know at least 12 hours, I'm just coming back with, I think it was either 400 or 600 grit, I honestly can't remember. It's just enough to kind of even out the surface a little bit. We're not actually taking off any of the finish. We're just kind of evening it out a little bit. And then after that, we basically wipe it clean and then do the same process over. So as you can see with both of these coats, I'm using this polishing pad that is attached to the bottom of my random orbit sander. I got these because um, the guy at Blacktail Studios uses this um, big uh, random orbit polisher and I didn't have one of those so I was kind of trying to replicate what he was doing and I think it was just kind of the wrong way to do it. These polishing pads are nice but when you use them with this hard oil they kind of dry up after that first application. There's no real good way to clean it. So I would actually just recommend using like a disposable microfiber towel or using like a really good shop towel, like those blue shop towels I always use. Those actually ended up being really decent. And this polishing pad ended up just kind of being really stiff and scratchy after that first one. So I don't really recommend using those because it does turn into a one-time use kind of thing. I will fully admit that I'm not really sure exactly what I'm doing with this project. Um, this type of thing is pretty new to me, so I'm just kind of telling you all of the little uh, missteps that I'm making. I finished the front and I just really wasn't happy with the back. The back was brushed with the Scotch-Brite pad and if you've ever brushed aluminum with a Scotch-Brite pad, it tends to be very, very delicate. You can see pretty much every single little scratch and just in the process of finishing the front, it really did kind of add some scratches and stuff to the back and just handling it adds that. So I decided to actually go back and do the random orbit finish on the back as well um, because that will just end up being a little bit more durable. I know that it's going to be against the wall. I know it's not going to be seen, but it just kind of bugged me that it's really difficult to get perfect brush marks um, by hand. And so I just went back and used the random orbit sander on the back. I sanded the back with the 180 grit and then the 220 grit and then used baby oil once again just to help prevent some of the fingerprints from showing up. And this is what it looks like in the end. It's, you know, it's good. It's fine. I'm relatively happy with it. Um, this also helps the engraving pop a little bit more. The nail polish ended up being a little bit more dull than I had wanted it to be and that's totally fine. I'll play with engraving on some other project. Um, but with the Random orbit sanding, the contrast is a little bit nicer, so the engraving pops them. I'm reasonably happy with how the back came out. I was reasonably happy with how the front looked, but I wanted just a little bit more shine and a little bit more depth out of it. It was a little bit maybe too satin and plain for my taste. So I decided to get the buffing pads that I saw um, Blacktail Studios using, and since I don't have this big buffer, it's made for like a floor buffer or something like that, I just cut them down to size to fit on my random orbit sander. And um, check the link down below, these ended up fitting perfectly on my little random orbit, you know, once I cut them down. So this will allow me to kind of buff it in, which helps to give a better sheen. And that's all I'm doing here is just cutting these down to size, and I'm going to do two more coats and then try and really buff that in and get more shine out of it. And here is the final finished product. I ended up just doing one more coat of the Osmo. It started to get a little bit too glossy for my liking, so I stopped with just the one extra coat. And this is what it looks like, the level of sheen that's on it right now. The finish isn't perfect, but I'm pretty happy with the outcome, so I'm just gonna leave it like this. So let's get some nice close-up glamour shots.
So I think overall I'm pretty happy I took on this project. I learned quite a bit. Uh, this was my first time really messing with epoxy, first time really messing with um, wood all that much, and certainly doing the inlay. So I learned a lot of different things from doing that. I'd say the overall finish is good, not perfect. There's definitely some flaws here and there. And I think it comes down to the combination of aluminum and wood. You can only really finish one of them the proper way. With the aluminum, ideally you'd want to go a lot higher than a 320 or even 400 grit. You want to go a lot higher than that to get a nice uniform finish. So it's always kind of balancing the finish on the aluminum versus the finish on the wood. So each one of them is a little bit of a compromise. I'm pretty happy with the Osmo finish. Um, I think I've learned how to use it a little bit better after this project. I think ultimately what you need to do with the Osmo is put it on very, very light and buff it in. Of course, with the transition from the metal to the wood, I was having a lot of issues with it going on kind of too heavy because obviously it's not absorbing into the metal. So then it would all kind of um, stick on the wood. And when you would kind of buff it around, it would just kind of evenly coat and it doesn't dry or cure, I guess, the same way that it does on the wood as it does the metal. So that was a little bit of a challenge because normally you'd want to come back through with like a 600 grit and just lightly sand that down but it would sand very differently on the metal than the wood. So once again, just the challenges of this project were because I was using the two dissimilar materials. So the only thing left to do is to get the French cleat attached on the back and get this hung up on my wall, and then I can call this project complete. But I'm not actually gonna be mounting this on my wall. I filmed these videos ahead of time, so this is done a week or so in advance, and this is actually going to get shipped out. I've got everything ready and prepared for this to be shipped, and as soon as this video is done, it is going to be shipped out to my dad. And by the time he watches this video, he usually watches these, about the time they come out Sunday, he will realize that he's getting this in the mail. But he's not actually getting this in the mail, it will already be in his house. So dad, you already have this in the house, go talk to mom, it's somewhere in your house right now. So I wanted to send this out to him as just kind of a generalized thank you for all the support that he has done to my channel and all my various hobbies over the years. So thank you dad, enjoy it. For everyone else, thanks for watching, thanks for following along, and hopefully this gives you a better idea of everything that is involved with CNC. It is not just pointing a couple clicks on the keyboard and hitting a couple buttons. It's a little bit more involved than that. Um, as always, thanks for watching. I will surely be doing more woodworking stuff in the future. Check me on Facebook for any updates to my channel. Thanks again. See you next time.